<laughs> this is the uh, famous restaurant that we usually uh, have lunch with two, three, four times a week. And uh, you have the greatest bunch of friends uh, that, that you could ever ask for. It's the epitome of Orchard Park, New York. It's just a wonderful, wonderful bunch of people that will do anything for anybody. Now, uh, Paul has been pretty pretty uh, adamant about his uh, whole setup here. He's got this all lined up. And uh, Scott Beeler, I guess, is going to do the eulogy. And I'm supposed to sing at the, uh, at the uh, function. Um, that's not going to be easy because Paul and I go back 50 years. What he wants me to sing is Danny Boy. And let me see if I can do my best right now with this recording. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling from glen to glen and down the mountain. First day I met Paul Shire, he met me at his front door, welcomed me in with open arms, smiling, laughing, gave me a big hug, never met me before. There wasn't a lot of medical speak that day, but it was a beautiful conversation between friends. <laughs> Paul was diagnosed in April of 2012 when he presented to an emergency room with chest pain. He had a CAT scan on that admission, which showed a large tumor in the right upper lobe of his right lung. The tumor uh, was approximately that big around, which is pretty decent size for a tumor that had gone on undetected thus far. He had an excision of the right upper lobe of his lung, so the entire tumor was excised from his lung. At that point, he had the option of undergoing chemotherapy and he decided that he wasn't going to do it. He also at that time had opted not to do any further follow-up with an oncologist or a cancer doctor, so he spent the next year of his life doing his own thing. I was too old. I wasn't gonna go through another six months of what I had gone through with the surgeries, and, uh, and I felt it was getting close to my time, so why, live, why not live happily for the next six months or next year and worry about we know what the end result was going to be anyway. I think part of it has to do with he's, he's already seen some of his friends go through the chemo process. And I think he's, he's just seen the effects in some of his friends and I know he just does not want to do that. He didn't want to have to go into the hospital every couple of weeks. He didn't want, if he ran a fever, having to be in the hospital right. for 48 hours or so minimum. He just didn't. That would be too intrusive to him. Mm -hmm would just be squelching his lifestyle. I found out my dad was sick, terminally sick, on a, on a way back from work one day. He didn't want me to hear it from my mom or my sister. He called me himself. And uh, it's kind of one of those moments where you really don't know what to say. He had made up his mind that he didn't want to do chemo. And what can you do in that situation? He's the boss. It's his body. He can do what he wants. But it, it saddened us to, to think that he didn't really want to be on. But he's 87, and he feels he's lived a long life, and he's, he's ready to go. And we're all, we feel the same way, that if he's ready, he's ready, and we're ready. Can we talk about Dr. Shire? Yeah. He's up for research this week. Paul Shire is my 87-year-old patient with non-small cell lung cancer diagnosed in 2012. In the last month, he's had quite a few symptoms um, that we've done medical intervention for him. Um, he's had increased dyspnea, um, which we ordered oxygen for. He uses intermittently at night. He's starting um, to have a lot more symptom issues. That's what I noticed the last time I was there. But he seems to be handling them OK for the time being. Yes. He admits to not attending the church lately, but um, he is very interested in specifically the process of dying. It might be now that he's more symptomatic, 
it's a little bit scarier of a conversation as sure, well. Sure. I mean, back in November, he was so healthy. Yeah. It, it almost didn't look like he belonged in hospice. Yeah. Lorraine was excited because she was going to start taking her sleeping pill so she could sleep through the night and let Lynn take the night shift, which was important because I worry about her and I try to give her as much support as possible because everyone's taking care of Paul. And they're taking care of her too, but she, she's really taking that role of caregiving. And, and we know that night shifts as caregivers can be extraordinarily difficult, especially if nobody's sleeping well in the home. So, A patient qualifies for hospice when they have a terminal diagnosis with a prognosis or expected lifespan of less than six months. There are a few things that when people enroll in hospice, they are foregoing, and one is disease-directed therapies. So therapies that are directed at terminating an illness, those are the, the kind of things that hospice cannot support. You do not have to be what's called a DNR or a do not resuscitate to enroll in hospice, and those are all things we work through as a team. Palliative care and hospice are actually on the same continuum. Palliative care is pain and symptom management, as well as spiritual support for patients who have a chronic condition. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a terminal condition with a less than six month prognosis. Our focus as hospice and palliative medicine physicians though, is optimal pain and symptom management and, and planning ahead for the, the days to come with any chronic disease. I do think it's a crisis in this country in terms of helping people die with dignity. The biggest point that needs to be processed by the patient and the family is what's most important. Am I looking for quality of life? Am I looking for quantity of life? Recognizing that going the traditional route with traditional medicines doesn't always improve longevity, doesn't always improve the quantity of years to come. I thought he was very handsome. <laughs> <laughs> we just seemed to hit it off, and somehow I must have asked her if she'd be interested in going out. We had no money. We didn't have anything. One bedroom for the five of us. We had to share the bathroom with the neighbors, and the kitchen was only wide enough for Lorraine to walk in, and she put up with that for three years. 62 years. 62 so years. Next month. I wanted to be a dentist from a little kid up. I was always interested in helping people, too. I, I enjoyed that very much. He's very caring. If you want something bad enough, never let anyone talk you out of it. Yeah, the only time I ever saw him cry was when his own father died. His words to me were, now I'm the old man of the family. There was no older generation, and he felt the weight of that, that he had to lead the family, and he has led the family. He's um, not going out any longer for meals with his friends. He hasn't been out of the house in over a week. And that's partially because he is more short of breath and um, partially because he's less ambulatory. For example, he took a fall in his home the other day, which has significantly weakened him. And he's also developed what we call delirium, which is a hard to control manifestation of chronic illness where he is hallucinating on occasion and reaching for things that aren't there, talking to people who aren't there. Those have been the major changes, but his breathing is really significantly worse. I accept the whole procedure. I'm ready to meet my maker, but my family has been, what I put them through, it's been tough. Certainly, this is a very difficult time for caregivers. Children especially, who are seeing their parents fail. Real life doesn't stop. The real world doesn't stop, even though we're experiencing something so profoundly difficult. The bills still need to be paid. The groceries still need to be shopped for. The laundry still needs to be done. The kids need to be run to school and picked up from school. Their sports schedules don't stop. So there's a lot of um, families that are feeling torn between helping the, the nuclear family and helping their parent and also being the number one provider for their families. Figuring out when to come up here was, was, was pretty tough. 
<laughs> I keep saying don't worry about the money, but I'm worried about the money. Yeah. <laughs> it's my busy time of year. It's, it's not like it's going to crush me, but my focus right now is for my mother. To, to be there for my mother and my sisters. I've been the primary caregiver uh, for over a year now. And I have some very wonderful lady friends, and they do look out after me. We go for lunch every once in a while, and the girls encourage me to go. They say, Mother, you don't need to be here. But I feel guilty even when I go. It does put your life on hold a little bit. It's hard to make any future plans, vacations. You don't want to be out of the country. You don't want to be gone um, too far, you know, where you couldn't get back within a few hours. So that part is difficult for us. We're all so thankful that our family is, is cohesive in the fact that we're all helping. Everybody plays to their strengths. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think we all would agree on what Debbie just said. I feel the same way. I mean, every time somebody invites me someplace or wants me to do something, <clears throat> it's always prefaced <clears throat> with, if everything's okay with Dad. I think he's done everything within his power at this point to cover everything he needs to cover, make amends with everybody he needs to make amends with, say his goodbyes <clears throat> to those that he needs to say goodbye to. And in the same manner, he is still trying to keep some kind of normalcy with a relationship with those people. And Which you can imagine. You know, mm -hmm. so that is huge. It's, it's a, huge it's, for him. It's a difficult thing, too, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. part of what you're saying is final, right? Exactly. Goodbyes, I'm sorry, I love yous. We always say, you die the way you lived. So oh, he's doing he's, a great oh, job. He's, yeah. doing he's doing it. He's doing it. Who he is as a person is going to change. Yeah. His father didn't teach him how to die, and I think in the back of his head, he's, right. he's kind of teaching us how to yes. go out as a, a, as a, as a mm -hmm. strong, good person. Part of him dying with dignity is coming from you guys, too just so you know that. It's not all him teaching us, and you guys are teaching him, that it's okay to be dad, even though things aren't the same. I think one of the things you're doing really well is embracing your family being here. Yeah, no, that is nice. I, I really appreciate that, but that's one of the things that upsets me too. Why? This has been going on for three or four years now. And that's enough to put anybody through. But again, thank God to you guys. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. The woman, terrific, really, thank you. Well, we love being here with you. So. And I'll tell you what, I think most of what you're feeling is what you're feeling and not what they're feeling. I know you're trying to experience what they're feeling on their end. Yeah, I guess I am. Your kids are having a good time. I know they they're are. They're enjoying this time, and you're you're actually giving them a gift. I hope so. More than one. Well, I hope I hope they learn the good things. I don't tell them everything I did. <laughs> what scares me most would probably be waking up in the morning and finding that he had passed. But I knew he wouldn't be scared. He wouldn't be scared. Because you know what he's like. He's, he's a tough guy. So and there's nothing we can do about it anyway. I mean, life is life. Everyone has to die. Everyone has to go through their own way of death. And. I think he's handling it very well. And I think we're doing pretty good too. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. From glen to glen And down the mountain side You never know how you're going to react to somebody's passing, especially someone who's that close to you and someone who you've cared for. We talked before about people's hopes and dreams change as this process evolves. So initially their hopes and dreams were for a cure. 
without Paul having to go through treatment. And as time progressed, Paul's hopes and dreams changed so that his passing would be quick and not a burden on his family. And as time evolved, the daughters gradually realized that, you know, they wanted that for their dad. They wanted a quick passing for him. They found that, as people often do, it's harder to watch them stay than it is to let them go. So I think everyone was relieved when Paul did finally pass. And relief is such a common emotion at the end of somebody's life, and it's an okay emotion. I think Paul taught his family what dying is about. I think Paul made it okay to his family for him to go. I think, you know, Paul made the hardest decisions all the way through from deciding against treatment and in favor of quality of life. You know, quality of life was his theme all the way through. And I will sleep in peace until you come to me. I last saw Paul on Thursday, and most of my time was spent with his family, as it often is. You know, patients don't often have a lot of energy or a lot of breath to converse more than they had in the past. Unusually, I woke up with a particularly strong contraction overnight Thursday to Friday. My water broke three weeks early, and um, while we were in labor and delivery, being prepared for a C-section on an emergency basis, Paul was now in a coma, he was unresponsive. I think it's amazing and I have no explanation about how my baby was born within 24 hours of Paul's passing. And I truly do believe that as one life is ushered out, another is brought in.